Habakkuk 2 and 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, it's a song. And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. See, a lot of people start to write songs so we can remember verses. But here it is, it's saying that the earth will be filled with the knowledge. It didn't say that the earth will be filled with the wisdom. See, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is getting, you get it freely. Knowledge you got to work for. See, we go to church and we hear of God, but not many of us know God. I know you're saved. We can go to the extreme and how they used to say, saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. I know that, but there comes a time to where you have to know God even deeper than what you know God now. God is calling all of us to come to a deeper relationship with him. Where you know him now can be deeper. Where I know him now can be deeper. I want you to also understand how, where this word know comes from in the first book of the Bible in Genesis. And it says that Adam knew his wife. It was an intimacy. And the earth shall be filled with the knowledge. Knowledge by itself, it's not useful. See, in our ministry right now, we are filled with the knowledge of music. Y'all know that. I'm a professional musician. I've taught musicians who are not professional musicians. That knowledge is here. But do you know, it's not useful for you unless you want to learn my knowledge. See, the knowledge of God is here, but unless you want to tap into that knowledge, it's not useful for you. Coming to church all the time and just hearing someone preach can be just a whole bunch of words. You can grab hold of verses and have them memorized and it still be just a whole bunch of words. But when you have a relationship with the God who said the word, then the word is no longer an empty thing. It says it will go out and it will not come back void. It will accomplish that that was intended from the foundations of the world. But that only can happen when my knowledge of the word has been mixed with a relationship with God. See, when God begins to come in and said, you know, the Holy Spirit is always wooing you to get closer to him. I don't know if you know that. When you got saved, you didn't get saved because someone preached such a nice word. You didn't get saved because you watched someone's testimony. You didn't get, you got saved because the Holy Spirit said, now it's time, come on. Come on, how long shall you be between two opinions? Come on. The same Holy Spirit that call you to repentance is the same Holy Spirit that says, now it's time that we get closer. Now it's time that you get a little deeper. It's time for you to learn how to swim and stop trying to walk. Because, you know, if you've gone to the beach, we went to Haiti, and in Haiti we discovered they have beautiful beaches, but no one swims in them. No one swims in the beaches of Haiti. Got to a beautiful beach. I mean, it was blue. You can see right through it. You see the fo folks just playing around, but no one's going into the water. And I asked the question, why isn't anyone in the water? And I got the answer right away. They don't know how to swim. And instead of thinking a negative thing, I thought of the church. We have the water of the Spirit of God, and it so has covered the earth, but we don't know how to swim. We're staying in the shallows because we feel safety. We can still feel the ground underneath our feet. It's getting a little too deep. It's time to go back because I don't know how to swim. When God say, walk by faith and step out into the deep step out it's all right i won't let you drown step out into the deep step out to where you can no longer feel the bottom 
You know how scary that is? In your whole own life, God has called you several times already to step into the deep. Not once, several times. Several times he's been let go of that and allow me to work. I don't know about this. I don't know. I've always done it this way. This is how it is. Lord, I don't know. I don't even think that you, you won't allow me to go into t something you said. And you, we begin to quote scriptures. You know, because we can use scriptures even when we're trying to, to be stubborn. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. I can't see it light onto my path. I can't see it. That can't be you. <laughs> God is calling for a deeper relationship. You want to know how miracles are going to start happening and how all of a sudden in this area there's going to be a strong move of God happening. How people are going to be saved and converted and how just like uh, in Ecuador, the buses will empty out in front of the church and everybody will rush in. You know how all of that will happen? That will happen the moment you begin to come here to worship God and that alone. How do you know this? Because I've seen it for myself. I got a chance to take... Erica with us to Panama. In Panama, she saw these people who were destitute, who had nothing. We had one lady that fell through the floor of her apartment. Because it was so eaten up by termites. Fell through. Couldn't hardly walk. Came to church anyway. Honey, what happened to you? I fell through the roof of my apartment, but you came to church anyway? Yes, be healed. The woman started walking right. You, oh, I would love to see that. No, you don't, because it will be entertainment for you. God is not wanting to entertain you. I have watched, have we've seen some people fall out, and the eyes are like, wow. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be, oh, wow, look how God is moving. It's supposed to be God is here. God is here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. God is present here. It's sitting there just Googling at things that are happening. God is present here. Don't you know what that means? There are a lot of churches that God is not present in. You seeing a sign or a wonder happening, God is present. Our attitude is not to raise that miracle to where that's God. God is God. And God is present here. And our attitude in the next year, when we come into service, I came here to see God. Move out of my way. We can talk after service. I came here for the purpose to see God. I need to see God. I need to see God move before the end of my life here on earth. Be like that man who said, God told him, I will allow you to live long enough to see the promise. And as Jesus was going to be circumcised and he gets to see the promised Messiah. And then he thinks to himself, finally, I have seen what God has promised. Now I am ready. That we can come. See, I... My desire is not for a little church. This is not for a big church either. I don't care about that. That is not important to me. You know what's important to me? The kid today that's committing suicide right now as we speak. That's important to me. Because to me, I have failed that kid. Because here I am with the word and the truth and the light. And I haven't been able to bring it to him. Because I've been so busy doing other things. See, there's a world outside of these walls. As long as we think inside the walls, guess where we're going to be all our lives? Inside walls. I understand that being inside walls is to be imprisoned. We say we're free. 
but we always usher ourselves into walls. There is a world out there that needs to see that you and you and you and you and you and you have an act of God working inside of you. Not, oh, I go to a church where, you know, the pastor, to, no, that's time for that to end. In the New Testament, you have the waiter laying hands on people. The waiter. Oh, we make it sound really pretty. Stephen, oh, he got, he got stoned and he saw, oh, I see him sitting in the right hand of the father. What was Stephen doing? Waiting tables. Could you imagine going to the restaurant somewhere and the waiter lay hands on you and you feel the anointing of God just permeate through you? you imagine what that would feel like? That even the waiter is so committed to God that glory shows up in him? Could you imagine that? They gave him the task. Because they said, Peter said it's not for us to wait on tables. Let's give it to people. Which people? The people had a strong responsibility just to wait tables. It weren't just anybody. It was people that were already mature. You don't get no job as a waiter being very mature. But in God you do. Because we are called servants. We're called here to serve. Jesus said, I did not come here to be served. I came here to serve. But then we have church people to come into the, the, the house of God and says, I came here for you to serve me. Serve me. Bring me a word I've never heard before. Lay hands on me and take away all the stuff that I've done all my life. Come on, if you can't do it, and I don't think God is in you. How did we get here? Who told us those lies and why do we believe it? I'm not here trying to make myself a super pastor because that's nonsense. Jesus came as a servant, so how am I supposed to come? I come here to serve too. There's no one here that's too old or too young to be used by God. There is no one here. I don't care your handicap. I really don't. Because God can use you in spite of a handicap. A lot of you don't know this, but I had to take speech lessons, speech therapy, because I didn't know how to pronounce words right. My tongue got in the way. I was told I would need to have surgery in my tongue so I can pronounce things right. I got no surgery, but I'm here before you speaking. Some of you don't know how hard it is for me to pronounce the next word. But with my limitations and all, God, you are able to do exceeding and abundantly above all I think or even imagine in Christ Jesus. Lord God, you're the one who gave me this tongue. You could have given me a perfect tongue, but you gave me this tongue. And now, see, the enemy thinks I'm going to sit back and give all my excuses why I can't be used by you. But he don't know that you always take the lowly things and propel them forward. He don't know that you gave me this tongue so I can come before great men and open my mouth and speak. See, I could easily sit and do nothing. My wife can easily not do any dance. The doctors told her she will never dance. My wife is very bow-legged. You don't know that after she danced, she goes home and has to have massage and heat pad and everything on her knees. You don't know how much it costs her just to be able to wave that little banner in front of you. You don't know that. But it's easy for her to say, you know, this hurts. Let me sit down and just be quiet and not do anything because, you know, God did make me this way. But instead, she says, I'll be the one who's doing it hardest than everybody else. 
If we can have the attitude that we've read in scripture, if I perish, let me perish. Come on, it might be the last time I'm doing something, but I'm going to do it to all I can do it. God is calling us to play. Stop giving limits to God. Stop limiting him or what he's going to do through you. It, I know how you were raised. I was raised in worse situations. I know what you have and what you don't have. I had a little and I've had much and I've had a little again. Look throughout scripture and see that there's a pattern that always happens. Here's the pattern. God always chooses people that are not worthy. Come on, here comes Moses. Go and talk to Pharaoh. God. See, it may sound funny, but do you know that God wanted to heal Moses? Oh, I can prove it to you. God said to Moses, wasn't I the one who made the tongue? And Moses says, can Aaron speak in my place? Aaron, you shall be the voice of Moses. <laughs> Haven't y'all noticed that? That Moses could have just all of a sudden and, Lord God, I saw you in the burning bush. I saw that bush that was on fire and didn't burn up. You are the one who made the tongue. You want me to speak to Pharaoh? Fix the tongue so I can speak to Pharaoh. But instead, his brother had to be his mouthpiece. We limit God. We limit God. Because the world tells us we are limited. According to the world, yes, we are. But according to God, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Inside of me lies the power that said, let there be be and it was it is inside of me how dare you enemy tell me i can't do something because i'm a limited to this flesh don't you know there is no limit in god I'm not limited by the things that i see because i live by faith you're not limited by things that you see you have been, but the time needs to come to you. Stop being limited by what you see. I'm going to tell you the fact about where we live. Right now in the city of Anniston, Alabama, it is not proper for me to have more than one or two white members in our church because of my skin color. If I was white, yeah, I can have a lot of black folks. But being that I'm black, I'm not supposed to have a lot of white folks. That's a fact of where we live. In Christ, who cares about that fact? <laughs> who cares about that? Because God is telling us something different, and I want to go to that verse. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 27, 29. Verse 27 to 29. I want to see an outpouring happen in our city. Like our city have never ha happened before. I want to see it. I want to be in it. I want to be to where, yeah, this is God. God doing what God wants to do. But this is some of the things that need to happen. Galatians 3.27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant, heirs according to promise. What has stifled the move of God from moving in the city is that we have these classifications. I know slavery is over with, but we still have classifications of people. You, I can go right now to a church that's considered to be a rich church. You want to be a member of that church? You better have money. If you don't have money, 
you can come to that church, but no one's going to be friendly with you because you need to have money. If you don't have money, you better have education. You better be doctor somebody. You better have a title that goes because you are not welcomed there unless you have some of that. Right now, we have black churches. Yeah, they'll let you come in if you're white, but you never feel like you're part of because you're not the same race that they are in. We have white churches. See, here's the thing. We all were raised pretty much here, and we don't know that some of that stuff got on us. But for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to begin to happen in us, there has to be a point to where none of that stuff affects you. You got to get to the point that neither slave nor free, neither rich nor poor. You get to the point to where, hey, I can be all things to all people outside of here. But when I'm in here, I am part of all of you. Yeah, I know how to act rich. Believe me, I can go to the rich churches and they'll think I'm rich. And they'll accept me right in there with them. And why would you go to a church like that? Because I'm a double agent. Hey, I know how to get into places where I'm not supposed to be welcomed. I know how to do it. I've done it before. Why? Because the Bible says be all things to all people. Be all things to all people. Here is the thing. We can get, oh, I'm good with whites and I'm good with blacks and I'm good with Hispanic and I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But the moment you have someone that walks in here that's very rich, that's only used to rich people, we get a little snooty with them. Because now you got to fit our group. Come on, I'm talking about where we are. We don't know how to allow them to be part of us. So we become a clique ourselves. We become that you need to shed all this stuff so you can be part of us. No, let's get to the point where it doesn't matter that you're rich. I, I like you even though you have money. But I don't like you because you have money. Hey, I like you even though you're black. But I don't like you because you're black. Get to the point to where we can honestly begin to shed junk off of us. Because when you've been around it, you start to smell like it. it. You've been around smokers. Don't you smell like you were smoking? And you can't help but get that smell on you. You've been around it, so it gets on you. And when we come into the house of God, Lord God, we got to come with clean clothes. Lord, I'm taking out this garment of heaviness. I got to change the clothes over here. I'm putting on instead the garment of praise. Come on. You got an attitude of heaviness? You're not even supposed to come in the house of God with that. Come on, I'm just being really, really down to earth here. You got junk that's happening in your house, and you come inside the, the, the house of God with all the junk on you. You're not even supposed to do that. You're supposed to exchange your stuff. Exchange. Didn't Jesus exchange his life for yours? Then you need to exchange your junk and come in here with the right attitude. I'm going to praise God no matter what is happening outside of here. Hey, they might be picking up my car out of the driveway right now, towing it away, but I shall deal with that after I finish praising my God. Amen. Our attitude should be different when we come before God. I got to come and have an attitude adjustment. I got to get rid of my stinking thinking. I got to, hey, I'm, I'm called to minister. I'm called to minister. You know, when we say the word minister, all everyone in here has been taught minister is a pastor. Some of you that have been in churches that are moved with the Holy Spirit, a prophet, an evangelist. We have the normal pastor teacher. You're a minister. Oh, which church do you pastor? I was a minister before I pastored. Hey, I can tell you I have proof that I was a minister before I pastored. I have people that can say, hey, Ronaldo made a difference in my life even before I ever called myself pastor. Why? Because that's what ministry is. 
Do you know no one ordained Jesus? Oh, I'm really going to mess it up for you. He had no ordination service. Come on. You see, we have twisted things. We have made it to where now I am worthy to do this. No, I'm just recognizing what you've already been doing. That's all it is. You've already been doing it. You are recognized now because you have already been doing it. Jesus went to John the baptizer. And John the baptizer said, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, suffer it to be so, to fulfill the word. What? What are they doing? Jesus said, I need to be baptized. And you're baptizing. So baptize me. Wait. See, I didn't call him John the Baptist. I called him John the Baptizer. Why? He was already doing it. He didn't wait for Jesus to come along to say, now my ministry of baptizing people has begun. Come all you who labor and are heavy laden and I shall give you rest. Repent for the kingdom. He didn't wait to then. He was already doing it. He was already doing it. So Jesus shows up and he goes to the one who was already doing it. And to suffer it to be, to fulfill the word. And here it is. Jesus goes under the water and comes back up again. And John the baptizer gets to see the Holy Spirit as a dove. And descend upon the Lamb of the God. And God is going to recognize now before men what Jesus has already been doing. He was already doing it. Jesus already had a few disciples when he showed up there. And all you hear that voice that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. No, we want to start. We come to church so we can start. You started already. Oh, maybe some of you will get it when you get home. You started already. There are people looking at you for ministry right now. They're not waiting for you to get credentialed and get a license. They're not waiting for that. Imagine what would happen to the lost if everyone had to get credentials before anyone got saved. There was a time that we need to understand God called us already. Many were called, so we don't take the glory because we were called. But few were chosen. What's the difference between the called and the chosen? I'll tell you the simple truth about the called and chosen. The, all of these folks were called, but the one who moved are the one who were chosen. If I sit here and I were to say, all my kids, come up here. And you see one or two of my kids, those one or two are the chosen ones. The other ones who didn't move have kind of relinquished their right as children. So are you moving? Or are you straddling the fence? I don't know. He's asking too much for me. Uh, this is comfortable right here. Really? That don't look comfortable to me. You're going to get tired of that position in a little while. That, and especially you can't let go because you got a fence in between. That's not comfortable. Who told you that lie? I'm going to be a little bit in the world and a little bit in the church and a little bit in the world and a little bit in church. Come on, don't you know? I said this yesterday, and I said it kidding, but I, I, I really mean it. The Bible says this, I will prefer you to be hot or to be cold. But if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Let me explain it in a simpler term. When you're cold outside, you want to drink something hot. When it's out outside, you want to drink something cold. 
See, but if it's hot outside and you drink something lukewarm, it upsets your stomach. And your stomach says, I can't handle this. So the stomach lets it back out again. What God is saying here is very simple. Be hot or cold or else you make me sick. Be one or the other. Be a sinner or, or, or be saved. Is that what God is saying? Yes, that's exactly what God is saying. Be one or be the other. Don't sit there and I'm going to be both. You cannot be both. You sit there thinking you, you are on the fence. No, you are on the bad side already. That level of commitment God is calling us to is the same level of commitment he called us from the beginning. He says, if you want to gain your life, you need to lose it. No, I'm not asking you to drink some Kool-Aid and stuff and do that crazy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. You gave your life to the Lord. It's no longer your life. Now you do what he's called you to do. It's no longer yours. You don't get the option to sit there and reason it out. It's my life. I get to do what I want to. No, it's not your life. Why? Because you were predestined. Man, God really dealt with me with that predestined thing. I, and when God showed me, I didn't like it. See, here's the thing. Some of us have our own destiny. We have, we've marked out our plans of how we're going to live our life. And we're aiming towards it. But then God says, I have a destiny before you found yours. Is your predestiny. You were predestined. It was already written about you before you were even inside your mommy's uh, tummy, if I should say, with little kitty words. Your life was already written out for you. And what happened is, since we have free will, we can choose to do what God wants us to do, or we can choose to do something else. I'm here in Anniston, Alabama. I didn't want to be here. My wife didn't want to be here. I remember the first time God told us about Anderson, Alabama. We were doing really, really well in Miami. And I asked my wife, if God were to tell us to move to Anniston, would you move? And my wife responded by saying, I will divorce you first. It was years before God sent us here. But notice the thought was already deposited. What if? When we got here, still didn't like it here. It was years before I felt comfortable. It was years before I understood this racial schism that we have here. It was years before I can finally say, you know what? God, I like your plan better than my own. I said, God, you know what I realized over the years? I'm a lot more calm in this city than I would be in Miami. I'm less stressed here than I was stressed over there. I remember driving in Miami and the highway will become a parking lot. And sit there and what would normally take you 15 minutes to do will take you four or five hours. And you're stuck behind a steer and steering wheel just sucking up fumes. When I go to Miami now, I'm like, I can't wait to go back home. I can't wait to go back to Alabama. I've had people to sing the song to me, and you come from Alabama with the banjo on your knee. And I'm like, you know what? I prefer the banjo than all the junk you're doing right now. I said, you know what God planned for me was better for me than my own plans. Because my plans weren't like this. I want to be the top concert pianist in the world. And I was working hard to be the top concert pianist in the world. You know what God told me recently? He says, Ronaldo, you would have arrived. What would you tell me that? You know, you got me here to where, you know, we have to wait for God to do a miracle to pay bills, and you tell me I would have arrived? Then he dropped the other foot, but no one would have been saved. You'll have no eternal reward. It will all be temporal nothing finite 
Come on, the world is telling you to be somebody. Yeah, you can be somebody. But what are you going to be that somebody for? We're only here temporary. And you may think 70 years is a long time. 75, 80 years is a long time. Eh? Hey, you're not Methuselah. You, you don't get to live 996 years. And even Methuselah, even the oldest man, he came out of Enoch. Come on, he had someone to give him some revelations so he can live long. Our time is very limited. Let's lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt, where thieves cannot come in and steal. Let's lay up treasures. Do you know how great it is that we can open our Bible and read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that was written by Moses? You know, if he didn't write it, we wouldn't know of Moses. If God didn't allow Moses to be written in his word, none of us would have heard of him. There are people that are written in the Bible just as a memorial. Do you know that? The woman that went and had her alabaster box and opened up the alabaster box and put all that perfume on, the, uh, on Jesus' foot, she was written as a memorial. Here we are today. This was over 2,000 years ago. We are still talking about the same woman. Isn't that better than being the greatest concert pianist that 100 years from now, no one would know? Yeah, I play Beethoven. I play Mozart and Chopin. I appreciate their music. I know a little about their life. But after that, no one got converted. I love here at least. I tell you what, there's no life in it. It's a, just a beautiful piece. It's good for my ears, but it's not good for my soul. What counts, it's what's good for the soul. Can you reach one? Can you leave out of here today? I'm called to reach one. See, I already hear some of the things that y'all are saying. I don't know as much as I should know. No, you don't, and you never will. So do it anyway. No one is asking you to know everything that's in the Bible. For no one knows that but God. Just wherever you are, reach one. My piano teacher, when she passed away, she was Catholic, and I was praying, Lord God, give me the courage to be able to present the gospel to her because I don't know if she ever received you as her Savior. And then she passed away. How horrible would it be that my piano teacher didn't get to make it in? What a tragedy that would be that the one that loved me, even though I didn't deserve her love, would not make it in. Reach one before they become unreachable. You only have a one life to live that's not just a soap opera. You have one life. If you're consistently living your life to please yourself, you'll never be satisfied with your living. But if you continually are working for the benefit of others, you will find joy. You will find life. For he who gives his life will gain it. But it also say, but he who gains his life will lose it. It's up to you today. 
See, we're having this new year coming in, and I know about new year resolution, but God told me to begin to teach about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is the outpouring. We got to get to the point to where all of us are active. I'm, I'm not just a member of the church. I'm active. I'm active. Go home, Lord God. I have this hang up and this hang up and this hang up about these type of people and these type of people. And come on and be honest because God already knows. Be honest. Don't sit there and try to sugarcoat it. You're in your own closet. Nobody else is hearing you. Be honest. I got problems with these type of people, Lord God. Help me. To even the man in the Bible says, yeah, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. What is he saying? I believe to a certain level. I don't believe to the level that I need to believe. I believe to a certain level, but can you help me believe bigger? Be honest about your hang-ups. Because if not, your hypocrisy shows. You ever been around people that are talking to you really nice, but you know they don't like you? Oh, I see a few people shaking their heads. Your hypocrisy shows. You can go to someone and be, oh, I love you. And I, oh, you dress so nice. And they're like, oh, you need to stop. You got me smiling because you have that fake smile, and I have, the, have that fake smile too, so I don't make you feel uncomfortable, but you need to stop. Let's get honest. Be brutally honest. I had a chance to preach to a house full of pastors maybe five or six years ago. I was the only one of this color. And I was, it was a blessing. I'm full with pastors. And these pastors, there were some that were missionary in Africa. Some were missionary in India. So, and they all live within this area. And they're, they're ministering to the people who are really, really poor and destitute. And they live in those nations. And they came back to have this little gathering and kind of get juiced up to go back into their mission field. And it is my turn to preach. And one of the pastors said, I have my hands burning, so I feel that God wants me to take over and I minister today. And I looked at him, you with your burning hands, sit down. It's my turn. Now, some of you understood it right away. They're the first ones that made those little noises. See, they understood my chance can easily go away because, you know, they have their hands burning. And he came back, he says, but my hands are really burning. I said, listen, my hands are burning all the time. Sit down. And I ministered to those pastors about racism. And I said, you know, all of you go and minister to black people in Africa and you minister to brown people in India and you minister to yellow people in China, but you will never bring them home. As long as you can go over there and minister over there and they stay there and you come back, you are okay. Yes, all of you in here are racist. That's what I said to a whole bunch of pastors who go to other countries and minister to other people. Because that's what God gave me to say. And we saw the Holy Spirit fall in that service. And I said, anyone in here who has problems right now in those areas that came forth today, come up here right now. And would you believe every pastor came forward? So don't tell me you don't have issues. Because we all have it. If it's not a racial issue, it's an uh, uh, ethnic issue. If it's not an ethnic issue, it's a finance issue. If it's not a finance issue, it's a body type issue. If it's not a body type issue, it's a male issue. It's a female issue. We have issues. And we need to do just like the woman with issues. Go and grab the hem of his garment. Get rid of our bleeding issues. And be healed. Because God wants to move in our 
right here in our city, right here in our church. God wants to move. But our, unless our bleeding issues stop bleeding and be healed, then there's not room for, there's not strength to be able to withstand the substance of the glory of God. Let's get rid of the issues. I know I have a few. Oh, Reverend, all the you love everybody. Yeah, but you don't know how I talk to myself about some people. I have to talk to myself to go talk to them. Because, yeah, I still have issues. But I have placed myself right there at the hem. Lord God, you can stop this issue right now. Lord God, let me see them with your eyes. Because none of us were worthy. None of us. For we all have sinned and we've all fallen short of your glory. It's no one without sin. No, not one. And you allowed yourself to be the bleeding issue for us so we can be healed. He allowed himself to bleed so we can be healed. I'm believing that God is doing something in this city that is going to be written about for generations. I believe that we're going to see the news truck pull up because these people love each other even though they're black and white and yellow and Hispanic and green and purple and polka dot and whatever. They love each other no matter what. They're rich and they're poor and they're middle class and they're coming together as one people. They're worshiping God as one. They're not looking for a handout from one to the other. They're dead. They don't come for anything except let's come together and worship our God together. Don't you already see it that if that happens, you see what follows? Can't you see it already? If the rich church stops being a rich church and just become an everybody church? If the black church stop being a black church and becomes an everybody church. If the white church stop being a white church and just become an everybody church. Don't you see how the enemy has kept us from the glory? Let's denominate the people. Let's denumber the people. Let's number them. Let's place this tribe over here, that tribe over there, this tribe over there. To, let's make it to the tribe no longer has connection between one tribe and the other. Let's make it to where we do it for generations so we forget that at one time we were connected. That's what has been and that was never God's plan. For God said, they're one body. And Jesus prayed and said, oh, Father, let them be one as you and I are one. And the enemy said, let me separate them. Because if they come together, they will understand the power that compels them to come together. There is power in coming together. There is power. If you don't think so, get a rope and begin to take away each strand. You'll find that each strand in the rope, you can quickly just pop it. But put them all together and try to pop that rope and see. There is power in coming together. Begin to pray if you haven't already. Those of you who are fasting once a week, when you fast, Lord God, let us in this city be one. Oh, what about the whole world? You got to start where you are. You got to start where you are. Father, let my household be one. Let my family be recognized as my family, and I'm the head of that family, and you're the head of me. 
Lord God, that when people see my children, they see me. They see my wife. Lord God, let us be one as you are one. Father, that when we leave our house and come to our church, let our church be one as you are one. That we'll be one people. That we'll be able to be like the one who is the head of the church, Jesus Christ. That when we leave this body and we go to a community, Lord God, let this community be one as you and I are one. Come on. You, you want to see a power move or do you just want to come to church? I want to see the power of God move into this city. I want to see there are people who are sitting there addicted to drugs just get delivered. I've seen it happen before. Why can't it happen again? It can happen again. And the Bible says that God's arms are not cut off. <laughs> Some of us, we've cut his arm off. He's not able to reach out because he doesn't have arms. Uh, no, the Bible says he is, they're not cut off. You can try to all you want to. They're not cut off. There will be a move of God in this city. There will be. Now, you can start with having a move of God with you. Well, how do I have a move of God with me? Really? You want to know? Forget about yourself. Just a word of a song and concentrate on him. Forget you or what you want and focus on him. God, you are the author and you're the finisher of my faith. God, I'm here and I don't think I'm here where you want me to be. Give me an insight of where you want me to be. God, you asking me to let go of this, help me let go of it quickly. Help me change to the point that I can be effective to somebody else. I'm a light according to the word of God. Let me shine. 